Hi, everybody. I am Mala, Mala Kumar, an editor and author of children's books. I was with Pratham Books as an editor, and now I'm a consulting editor with I Wonder, the magazine. Uh, welcome to our monthly webinars. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, I Wonder is a science magazine for middle and high school teachers. It features writings uh, about the many dimensions of teaching and learning of science in class and outside it. This magazine is published in English, Hindi, and Kannada twice a year. As many of you may know, on the second Wednesday of every month, we invite uh, folks who have written for us for a live discussion. If you are a practicing science teacher, we invite you to write for us. To do this, please send us your idea in less than 100 words to iwonder at apu.edu.in. If you'd like to receive updates of each webinar and a free print version of each issue, please do subscribe to us by following the link displayed in the description of this video. You can also catch us on Facebook. For today's webinar, we have with us Abhisheka Krishnagopal author of the article, Art and Ecology, from our February 2017 issue. Abhisheka is an ecologist, visual artist, dancer, and nature educator. She uses her experience in field ecology and the medium of art to create awareness about nature conservation. Abhisheka is currently associated with the Education and Public Engagement Program of Nature Conservation Foundation. She has several years of experience in urban wildlife rehabilitation and wildlife research. Thank you for joining us, Abhisheka. Before Thank we you, start, Mala. Welcome. Before we start, let me give our audience a brief overview of the format of the discussion. For the first 30 minutes, I will ask Abhisheka some questions to dwell deeper into the article. All those who've joined us today, please type your questions in the chat box. In the last 30 minutes, I will request Abhisheka for her responses to these questions. So Abhisheka, all set? Thanks, Mala. It's, it's a privilege to be part of this webinar. And thanks to you and the entire I Wonder team. Thank you. Thank you. Abhisheka, you share such a lovely and important perspective in your article about art and ecology. Could you tell us something about why you wrote this? What personal and professional experiences shaped this perspective? Um, yeah, so I um, I initially have an initial, uh, initially uh, I was trained in fine arts. I studied painting. Uh, but it was during my um, uh, college days when I was studying to be an artist is when I got interested and involved in urban wildlife rehabilitation. So I was basically involved in rescuing and uh, rehabilitating injured and displaced wildlife in Bangalore. And that is when I, uh, you know, I really learned about uh, what unprecedented development can do to wildlife around us. And, you know, I had much more knowledge about the uh, wildlife that we share with, uh, which in fact got me very deeply interested in wildlife conservation. And then I went on to study ecology. Uh, so while uh, I was doing ecological research, I was studying birds. Uh, I, I also, um, uh, you know, uh, this was more than a decade ago where I used to also run a coordinator uh, state level education program for rural schools. That's when, you know, when I used to travel to rural schools, I realized this was like uh, in 2008 or something where there were not really, you know, great resources on local biodiversity and especially in uh, local languages as well as resources that were, you know, very uh, interesting for the children. They were much more technical. There were a lot of field guides which were technical, uh, which, you know, we couldn't ask children to use. Uh, that's when I really decided that I should use my training in the arts as well as my knowledge and training in ecology to bring together and create uh, resources and, as well as teach children uh, about uh, uh, wildlife. But then um, I must also share that, you know, there were two places that I visited, which was also a kind of a motivation for me to do what I'm doing today. 
uh, one is Pichandikulam in Oroville, where um, under the guidance of uh, well-known um, wildlife artist and researcher Eric Ramanujam, who's unfortunately no more now, uh, Pichandikulam does a lot of work using art to create uh, awareness about nature conservation. And they use a, a whole lot of different art forms from illustration to murals, uh, sculptures, and then the other one was um, when I visited, um, uh, I, I spent a month in a village called Reli in Kalimpong with uh, uh, botanical uh, illustrator Hemlata Pradhan. She she runs, uh, uh, she teaches rural kids uh, botanical illustration and I spent a month teaching these kids natural history. Since they were already trained in the arts when I uh, had to teach natural history, uh, it was easy for me to, you know, um, uh, integrate art into my teaching methods. And I must say that is where I start, really started experimenting, bringing art and ecology together to teach uh, kids. And the way they enjoyed uh, doing these sessions uh, is when I thought, you know, I should work much more on this. And I, I would also like to see many more people using uh, art as a way of teaching uh, natural sciences. And so that's how it all began. And uh, the, writing this article was one way of spreading the word about this. That's wonderful. What a journey, uh, Sheka. Huh? You start your article by sharing that our disconnection with nature is an important cause of many of the negative impacts that humans have on their environment. This may not be recognized enough. What do you mean by disconnection with nature? Could you share some examples of how the sense of disconnection is the cause for a negative impacts that humans have on their environment? Um, when I say disconnection, it means not being aware or acknowledging the life around us. Uh, so, so when you when you're not even aware of the kind of life that we share space with, uh, I think. Um, uh, uh, I mean, how would you um, even conserve them or pro protect these life forms. Uh, so I remember when I was a child, um, uh, we kids used to walk to school. And then when we walked to school, we used to engage so much with the trees around us, uh, you know, whether it's collecting certain pods or flowers or uh, plucking fruits. There was a lot of engagement with these trees. And then uh, which also meant that if, say, a tree, one of those trees were being cut down, we did feel for that tree because we had a personal engagement with this tree. But then, which is something that is missing uh, today because, uh, uh, for example, a lot of, uh, you see today that a lot of people uh, have issues with leaf litter. Uh, mm -hmm. So they would rather want that tree cut down than, you know, having to... Um, uh, but but they, that's because they don't realize that a tree, uh, one single tree is a home for so several birds and insects and reptiles. If people were aware of these things, then I'm sure that they wouldn't want this entire tree to be cut down. Or when we look at, say, a water body, when if people were aware of the kind of um, amazing life forms that live in a water body, I think we would think a lot about letting... Um, any kind of uh, uh, chemical influence into these water systems. So that that's where I felt that uh, it, it's um, we kind of are becoming more and more blind towards what's around us, or or even even at home or in our balconies in the city, the little life forms that share space with it could be spiders or ants. Uh, we are just not noticing these things because we are more. Uh, into this virtual world these days. Mm -hmm. Yeah, true. Um, so, Abhisheka, many studies suggest that this sense of disconnection can also affect the well-being of children and adults. Uh, your thoughts on this? Uh, so, my personal thoughts is, again, I, I come back to my own personal experiences that when, when during my childhood, uh, apart from, you know, uh, when I was busy with school or my studies, most of my uh, free time was spent outdoors. I I remember that I never knew what boredom means because there, there was just so much outdoors to explore outdoors and nature never, you know, uh, nature always has something to offer you, something something really interesting to offer you. 
and uh, even even with regard to my physical health like um, uh, uh, touch wood i've never had any kind of physical uh, health issues so far um, i mean i travel a lot i i eat and drink water anywhere and everywhere but i've never really had any issues because um, and then also when it comes to um, mental health i personally believe that nature has a lot to uh, contribute to mental health uh, in own again coming back to my own personal experiences i've seen that you know every time i felt low or i've been i've go, gone through uh, difficult times it's always nature that i reach out to you know it 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 is all it's been quite healing when you take a walk uh, outside or spend time with trees or just watch birds and uh, i regularly encourage friends who are going through bad times to you know just step out and take a watch take i mean i take people on nature trails and um, i've heard friends tell me too that it that it does uh, help them so i i definitely believe that nature has a lot to offer right so nature as a healer huh you highlight the need to create educational experiences that help children develop greater sensitivity and appreciation for the natural world while these words may be familiar uh, they may hold different meanings for different teachers could you please speak a little about what you mean by the natural world what or who does this include also what do you mean by sensitivity for the natural world so for me uh, for me nature is not separate people we humans are part, part of nature um, i think when we when we um, understand that we are all interconnected we are all part of this world is when we can you know uh, appreciate uh, instead of saying we humans are different or nature is different and again when it comes to sensitivity i i feel for me it's about being sensitive to a, to the tiniest of insect to a blade of grass or uh, it's not just about big trees or big mammals uh, it's it's also about being sensitive to creepy crawlies around us because i uh, again see a lot of people uh, who love greenery they they want to be in green spaces they want to have pretty things like chirping birds and butterflies but they don't want to have anything to do with uh, insects and reptiles uh, so that is what i mean by being sensitive to every other life form around us because every life form has a purpose there is a lot of uh, interdependence so it's important to understand uh, that uh, we are not alone in this i think i just heard a lizard clapping huh somewhere here <laughs> um <laughs> You also mentioned that teachers may often teach about the environment uh, as a collection of scientific facts to be memorized. Instead, it may need to be taught in a way that awakens and nourishes the sensibility of children to the natural world. Uh, teachers teachers may find this uh, objective challenging for a variety of reasons. One of them being the difficulty of assessing if they have uh, they're making progress with this objective. based on your experiences of working with children from diverse contexts how would you respond to this uh, concern so coming back to um, evaluating whether a child child has changed um, attitude towards nature or, or, or being sensitive i think it is a bit difficult to um, uh, quantitatively assess the change uh because uh, anything about sensitivity it's not just about nature it's also about you know a human being it cannot be um, you know spoken in numbers uh so uh, sometimes uh, you might see it you might just see uh, the change in the child's behavior in the way it uh, starts looking around Uh, the surroundings or the appreciation uh, i can give i can give one example where um, uh, in one of the schools this was a place in ujrenia mangalore where uh, one of the girls one day came and spoke to me and told me that uh, she would walk to school every day and see these uh, flying foxes the big bats roosting and she had never paid attention until she had gone through one of the sessions that i had taken about bats and she said now every day i i watch these bats mm. uh so every day when i'm walking to school you know i i want to see something new and i am seeing something new which i had completely ignored before 
so mm. these are the kind of changes that you might see in children or when they do art the way what they convey through their art or how much interest they show in their art um uh, are some of the ways one can assess whether uh, they, 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 there is some kind of a change in their uh, being sensitive mm. towards surroundings that's so beautifully put abhishek thank you uh, you mentioned that when it comes to learning about the natural world art has an ability that conventional approaches lack how are these art mediated ways of learning different from the conventional approaches uh, do children respond to them in a different way or do they learn different things okay um here i would like to show uh, show some pictures to you know uh, so that i think it's uh, much more interesting if i could talk about this through examples okay uh, let good. me just present my can you see my slide show yes so it's just coming up yeah. ha huh. visible now yes we can okay. see so one so one of the examples i would like to um if you are taking a child on a tree walk or walk let's say people of taking a group of children on a tree walk if you are going to you show them trees point point trees then you want to names uh or you can talk about importance of these at the end of walk the children remember oh, a hand of trees or one or two but they may not remember the names of trees but then getting the getting children to spend time with tree even even if it's two trees asking them to see the leaves or the flowers fruits you know take in prayer about actually spend time with these trees to touch the yeah so uh, actually i can see those children drawing and you know i think they remember better when they draw and when they see it and actually notice what they're drawing uh, that's how they that's how art helps them to uh, learn better i guess so we'll wait for abhisheka to come back um so this artwork that you showed i think uh, which abhisheka showed that uh, that uh, appears some of those appear in the article 2 so for those of you who haven't seen the i wonder magazine uh, please do take a look the link is uh, in the description of this video and you can read it in english and kannada too um that has many of the pictures that abhisheka just showed us and uh, about how children learn more when they look at something and draw it rather than just uh, read about it or just look at it just look at pictures so abhishek i was just telling them about your article and uh, how children learn better when they uh, observe something and draw it out so that leads me to the next question you share that artwork can help improve the confidence of students in exploring new or unfamiliar species in their own neighborhood as a, as well as by observing and remembering their distinguishing factors uh, for those of our viewers who have not yet read the article i was just asking them to uh, please read the article but could you elaborate on uh, this with an example yeah um another example i want to talk about this um uh, say uh, there are um uh, this is an activity that i ask kids to do where i ask them to go and find animal homes wild animal homes so as soon as um mostly when you when you in the classroom when you ask children to uh, give out a list of animal homes they usually talk about mammals and birds uh, but then we ask them to step out i 
important term because most of the time what happens children only let say birdness uh, it's important to tell them to look at um, even even you know smaller animals could be a spider web uh, or where does the frog live where does uh, live so that way they they get to explore uh, uh, you know much more in much more uh, zoomed in way like uh like looking for where anim where insects live in in these tiny holes tiny burrows so that gives them some the kind of confidence to go and look at details look at that they've not let before i see okay so we can see uh, your voice was a little unclear in the beginning so i'm just repeating what you said uh so these are animal homes and you said you encourage children to look at animal homes whether it's a spider web or uh, you know um, ant nest or not just bird nests which get a lot of uh, Uh, children get excited about that too uh, so really it's lovely that children explore so much when they are given a chance to do that hmm? yeah uh, you can see in these photographs how uh, a, ch- a boy has climbed up a tree because he wanted to look at something there and then there are kids uh-huh. uh, observing ants and sketching ant ant nests hmm. hmm. um abhishekha you also shared that um, you know art can be used as a medium to share environmental messages and create awareness about critical ecological issues specific to one's own village or town city you know could you please explain this with an example yeah so when when working with children um when you talk a bit too much about issues it can be very intimidating because uh, we need to also understand that these kids are not responsible for the kind of environmental issues we see today and um, so uh, or even if there are certain acts done by the children uh, instead of being harsh with them we need to find ways of uh, getting them to understand that uh, you know something is uh, not okay but Uh, uh so so one of the ways so i have few examples to talk about here uh mm-hmm. so uh, one is you know where, where, especially when i work in the northeast or, or several no- rural areas kids have uh, this app just a minute of- just a minute could you um, move to uh, yeah you could share the full screen one ah uh, okay ah uh-huh. not yet okay never mind carry on yeah now- so uh yeah when uh, sometimes when you work in rural areas it's very common to uh, see children loud bird nests so one of the activities i get them to is uh, because they're so very knowledgeable about which builds what of nest i ask them similar methods and i to uh, make this we have a discussion around you know uh, does it feel if i dis- the the nest that they meet after spending some hours um and, and then it goes back to like how much uh, how, how how effort it takes to make nest and how we pull it down. so there are few ways of having conversation with kids of being touched towards to to, to what doing doing and um, Again, another uh, example is about um, uh so i'll just repeat okay. what you said your voice is breaking a little so for our viewers uh, who are looking at this you can see um children making birds nests so they had to first look at bird nests then observe what they saw write write it down and try to replicate the making of a nest and after they had made the nest as best as they could they were asked to destroy it they were asked to you know but just take it apart and that's when they realized that uh, it's so difficult to make a nest and therefore it should uh, it's something that we should we should not break it we should not uh, uh, you know harm nests because it takes so much uh, energy so much creation creatory work uh, creating happens and uh, that's the reason we have to take care of the nests or at least leave them alone so this is what abhishek was saying um 
Abhishekha, you mentioned that engaging with local environment can, can for example, lead uh, students to explore different kinds of colors and textures in the natural world with their senses. The nest building activity also must have uh, shown them that. Using different materials for artwork can also stimulate uh, student creativity. Again, could you elaborate with an example? Abhishekha? Hi. Abhishekha, can you hear me? So I think there's a pr small problem with the internet uh, at Abhishekha's end. Um, so Abhishekha has been doing these experiments with children all over in uh, many places, including in um, uh, with children near forests and uh, people who live near national parks, children who live near national parks. And she's found that even here, where children are so close to uh, nature, the way it's usually seen as. Even here, children and even adults aren't so aware of the biodiversity and the things around them. So when she does a session, it helps them realize that there are so many uh, life, uh, you know, life forms around them and so many things that together make up the ecology of a place. Um, Abhishekha, I hope you'll be able to hear me now. Uh, yes. You mentioned that engaging with local, uh, with the local environment can, for example, lead students to explore different kinds of colors and textures in the natural world with their senses. Using different materials for their artwork can also stimulate student creativity, you say. Again, could you elaborate with an example? Yes, yeah. Um, so if you can share, uh, see my uh, screen right now. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so so one of the things I get children to do is, you know, uh, work with a lot of natural materials. Uh, so by doing that, you know, it kind of um, allows children to go and explore their own surroundings and pick up materials uh, and then create artwork using natural materials. That way they're actually looking at the different colors. For, uh, for example, you know, it's very uh, common to think all leaves are green. But then when you start exploring your surroundings, when you realize the different colors, of leaves that you can find and then you uh, and then they start feeling the texture they know where things are found uh, so these are some of the experiences they get by just working with natural materials mm -hmm. okay uh, in your article you suggest that art may help reach out to even some of the most underprivileged and marginalized communities this is uh, really interesting uh, you art is able to uh, reach underprivileged and marginalized communities when all other forms of communication uh, with them fail. Could you please uh, tell us something about this? An example would help. Yeah, so with art, uh, art doesn't have to be always about working with expensive art materials. Um, so many of the uh, uh, schools or children I work with, uh, especially in in, uh, in remote places where, you know, art supplies are not available. I just work with whatever is avail uh, available around us. It could be just uh, picking up natural materials, uh, you know, cutting, pasting things or working with waste materials uh, or working with not just, you know, painting and craft, but also uh, uh, skits where you don't really need materials it's just about role play um so so that way uh, i think art doesn't have any bias towards the kind of background uh, children come from okay it's that's good. about that's how good. we how we work around uh, what we have around us 
uh, that reminds me of uh, some of the things you've shared in the article. Uh, you share uh, examples of artwork decorated with sketches of animals that people are often scared of, you know, snakes and things like that. Could you please elaborate on why and how you introduce this idea to students? Yeah, so what happens is uh, uh, um, kids are scared about a lot of a lot of things, especially you know, especially lizards and snakes, and sometimes frogs or insects. And uh, one way to uh, talk to them about these things is uh, to just get them to draw them, because when you draw, uh, when when kids draw, I do ask them like, did you get scared of this animal right now when you're drawing or coloring? Uh, and uh, most most often kids say no they weren't scared of drawing though initially when we when i say okay let's draw a snake today i mean there may be a bit of hesitation but once they start drawing and coloring uh, there's no fear as such so slowly that can um, it's not like you know in one session they get over their fear of uh, some of these animals uh, but it's just that it's a way of engaging um, you know, having starting a conversation about these wild animals and about their lives without uh, uh, the kids being too scared about them. Okay, okay. Uh, Abhishek, many of our readers and viewers are science teachers or teacher educators who may be interested in integrating art in their teaching practice. For them, keeping them in mind, could you outline what role teachers play in facilitating art as an approach to learning science? Um, uh, teachers, um, uh, again, I have to stare, uh, share an anecdote here. I, I remember um, this was when I was doing my pre university. I remember this um, uh, zoology professor. I, I think he used to teach in Alamin College in Bangalore. Uh, I, I had gone for one of his sessions at his house when he was teaching about microorganisms. Though I had learned, I was learning about these uh, uh, microorganisms in college in textbooks. The way he, you know, it was like he taught us through role play. He was showing us how these uh, organisms move and uh, even even today, even till today, I can, I can, you know, I have this uh, visual of how these organisms look or move thanks to the way he showed us through role play. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was the same with another, uh, with another course I had attended. This was on wetlands. Uh, it was on wetland conservation in, um, uh, this was uh, in Wageningen uh, University, Netherlands. One of the professors was teaching about about what is a wetland? How do you explain what a wetland is? And again, he did this, did this through complete role play. And these were, you know, these were um, uh, examples that from where I learned that uh, there are several ways of uh, using art to teach about science. Uh, it could be, you know, teachers can just start off through sketches. Um, so here's one example. Uh, this is a booklet, a, a booklet on biodiversity that I uh, worked on for Wipro Earthian for high school students. Uh, a simple thing as, uh, you know, how, how do you teach uh, scientific monitoring? Instead of asking children to just go and collect data in terms of numbers, you can ask them to sketch what they see. Uh, so they could maintain a diary of, um, you know, notes as well as sketches. So these, these are a few uh, examples of uh, teaching science through art. Oh, lovely. Uh, the first step in this process may be designing art-based activities. Could you share your process of designing them? What things do you keep in mind uh, to make them, you know, context and age relevant? Yeah, so um, the first and foremost thing when I uh, think about designing any education materials is to uh, know the background of the, of the uh, target audience. First of all, understand whether what the age group, not just their age group, but um, what kind of uh, schooling they come from. Is it a rural school, an urban school? It's an alternative uh, kind of education or the children are learning uh, going through a conventional form of education, what and sometimes even gender roles uh, uh, play a, a, a very important role. Um, I, I mean, I this uh, again, this was something I learned through my own mistakes uh, that I uh, during the initial days of my nature education program. So I must again share a, 
uh, an incident here where I had gone to, this was my very first nature education uh, workshop with children. I was teaching um, a session to uh, 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 a rural school in rural um, in Tamil Nadu and uh, having grown up in a city I, and also having learnt art I thought okay art could be a drawing could be a very good uh, medium of teaching children about uh, the, the biodiversity around us but when I went there and I, I, I had no idea that these kids had never done art before. The school didn't have any kind of art classes. Uh, so they were very, very hesitant uh, to draw and especially the boys in the class because they felt, you know, it's, it's only girls who draw and we boys shouldn't be drawing. So these were things that one needs to be very aware of the background of, of the students that you're designing your programs uh, for. Mm. Uh, so, so I had to kind of switch my way of teaching that workshop at that time. So, but these are lessons that I've learned to be very careful about. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, it's not like all methods work. Uh, so, one of some examples here is um, this is just a, a, a um, activity for junior school kids where you know the, to to teach them about the common birds around us but it can be just done through a join the dots kind of activity and then there are some simple questions which the mm -hmm. children can answer after drawing and uh, maybe for uh, you know a slightly older kids they could actually use some bit of uh, uh, folk art forms to draw a bird and then understand a bird another activity and um, uh, yeah, and then for high school students, they can, they can uh, you know, slowly start introducing issues because um, because for for little children, it's nice to get them to uh, experience the wonder of nature. But as kids get older, slowly they can start understanding the kind of uh, environmental issues around them. Mm -hmm. Lovely. This is uh, you've had a lot of experience, and I'm really happy you're bringing it all to us. Uh, so the art-based and focused on ecology, ecological education, uh, your experience, you also mentioned that uh, the background in art and ecology that you've had has shaped your perspective. Some of our teachers may come from a disciplinary background of, let's say, physics or uh, something different from ecology. Uh, some others may not have engaged in artwork at all. Art may intimidate them. Some may have had some experience in one or the other, but may not know how to connect these. Uh, so do you think, you know, um, how, do you, how do you design in a way that it is uh, easy for them to follow a step-by-step -step approach to designing? How would you do that? Yeah. Uh, so uh, one of the good things about internet is that it, there's, there's a lot of information out there that teachers could use. Uh, but then uh, what we have also done, uh, so I'm, I'm part of this uh, program called Early Bird in, um, uh, in NCF, where we have come up with a book for educators, where we have brought in learnings of of, uh, from our own experience as well as from other nature educators uh, around the country and uh, this book contains what to do what not to do and what kind of uh, uh, what, um, and, and it contains a whole lot of uh, creative activities as well as games as well as projects though this is a book for bird educators and through birds you can teach about other things in nature uh, so there are a lot of ready-made information available right now for teachers. So uh, they could just, you know, uh, take some of these activities and design their own uh, modules. Uh, mm -hmm. In fact, they don't have to do anything from the scratch. And then there is, um, for high school students, as I said, there is this uh, booklet on biodiversity, which Wipro Athian has come up with. And again, there are many activities through, uh, through sketching or role play or... Um, uh, you know, building things, uh, making art, murals, children can be taught about biodiversity and also conservation in, uh, issues. Uh, as well as another um, good resource is this Nature Classrooms, which also has a lot of resource materials. And Nature Classroom also has been, um, you know, working closely with the EVS curriculum. Uh, so there are a lot of really downloadable resources here too. And... Um, yeah, if you can share the links of um, 
the the handbook and the biodiversity booklet as well as nature classrooms in the chat then i guess uh, it will be useful for the uh, audience here Yeah. Yes, Abhishekha, we've shared it with them. Lovely okay. resources, indeed. As well as uh, another thing we've done on the early bird website is we are actually collating uh, all the uh, nature education materials that uh, educators in India are creating, oh. uh, and we have listed uh, all these on the early bird website in the resources section, so uh, teachers could take a look at that too. That's uh, that's wonderful, really wonderful. Um, Abhishek, one thing is that in all your activities, the outdoors play a key role. Could you touch upon this? Uh, when you take students outdoors, are there some precautions that you have to keep in mind as a facilitator? Are there some precautions that you have to ask the students to take? Uh, how do you go about doing this? Yes, yeah, uh, safety uh, is definitely a, a, a very important uh, uh, thing when you work when you are uh, taking kids outdoors. One is safety from the natural elements. It could be from insects or reptiles. Uh, so the teachers will have to be uh, the facilitators will have to be careful. And you know, when, when generally when we take kids out, we ask them to keep themselves. a covered and uh, bring water and cap if it is hot or you know rain gear other than that it is also important to um uh, say the so you uh, uh, know it's also important to have a lot of volunteers or caretakers when you're taking a huge uh, group of children and um, so again if you um, go back to, uh, if you can refer uh, to the bird educators handbook there's an entire chapter on safety and this book uh, is actually freely downloadable so uh, anybody can download and access this and take a look at the safety precautions that we have mentioned there oh that's useful that's very useful uh, abhishek some teachers may not have access to the kind of spaces that naturally encourage quiet reflection and creativity they may work in areas that are uh, largely cemented or may not have permission to visit uh, such areas some teachers may also argue that such outdoor experiences may be possible only occasionally hmm? rather than on a regular basis would you have any suggestions for them um yes um so uh, what we've also been doing uh, in the conservation education field because we do recognize that not all schools um, have access to outdoors a lot of activities we are designing is also indoors especially uh, that's where art also plays a big role because a lot of sketching or uh, working with paper collage uh, role play all these can be done indoors uh, so some with some of the uh, uh, materials that i've already shared with the handbook and also the uh, nature classrooms material um, you can already see uh, activities designed for indoor engagement and in fact uh, during uh, also this was uh, what was nice was during covid because we were all under lockdown and all of us were stuck indoors we did come up with a lot of um, online activities to uh, which could be done sitting indoors uh, actually if you also take a look at the early bird um, youtube channel there are a lot of webinars where you can uh, access uh, activities uh, mm -hmm. that can be tried indoors too that's nice that's nice we'll definitely take a look um and sorry to interrupt this is the page i was talking about in the oh, bird educators sure. handbook which talks about safety uh -huh. oh that's very nice um thank you thank you Abhisheka, you speak about how sometimes students have no formal exposure to art. Hmm? Uh, that they may not even uh, they may even express a fear of drawing or painting. 
Would you have any suggestions on how teachers can start this exploration in science or ecology uh, classes? You know, also perhaps some simple ex ex uh, ex uh, what say, experiments or exercises that can help students to begin their journey. In yeah, part yeah, definitely. Ecology. Yeah. So, so when I uh, when I take um, uh, you know sessions for both uh, educators as well as children, the first uh, thing is like you know uh, they say that as soon as I say okay we're going to art, do art today, they're like okay we, we are very bad at drawing, mm -hmm. and uh, but what we uh, one thing we need to recognize is you know art is such a big part of our culture. Uh, it's only in these uh, education, you know, uh, systems which say uh, which kind of segregate, saying okay, that person is a good artist and this person cannot draw. But uh, in our daily lives, like you know, in our culture, from you know, drawing rangoli to telling stories and songs, art has just been such a big part of our life. Uh, so I would, uh, what I would encourage people to do is one is. For teachers, they don't really have to teach art. They just have to be facilitators. You know, they just have to go ask children to do this or document that and using sketching. And for the child, the, the, the drawing that the child has made doesn't have to be like, you know, perfect or like a great drawing. It's the whole process of looking at that object. Uh, drawing is art is just a tool to uh, document or observe it need not be that you know you have to create a great artwork so one shouldn't really be hesitating doing art uh, so what i do so to get over this fear of sketching in in classrooms so one of the activities that i do you know you can just start with a very fun activity uh, i'll show you one of these activities here and if uh, uh, the audience if if you have a pen or pencil you can quickly do this is just like a, a, a two minute activity um, i'll just share my screen again Can you see the squiggle birds? Yes. Yeah. So what I encourage uh, uh, people who really have a fear of uh, drawing is, you know, you just you just doodle in your on your paper like this. It's just squiggle. And then all you need to do is, uh, this is about birds, but you can do it for other animals. You just have to add a beak, eye, and you know, legs, and turn it into a bird. I'll show you another example. Yeah, here I I turned I've turned another squiggle into a bird by just adding a beak and a tail and legs. So you don't need to be an uh, you know uh, expert in drawing to do this. This is so simple and so much fun. So mm -hmm. from here onwards, what I uh, do is I take them. Uh, so I usually do this um, uh, activity of uh, getting. Um, children or teachers to learn about how to draw a bird using few simple steps. So any any object or animal or even human, when you break it down into geometrical shapes and make it drawing the, that animal or plant or whatever becomes very easy. And uh, I've seen that, you know, every session I've done this activity, the teachers, uh, especially adults, you know, they're like, you know, we never thought we could draw a bird. You know, they're just so excited that they've actually drawn a bird. But it's as simple as that. So again, the Bird Educators book has this activity, as well as in the Early Bird YouTube, there is a recording mm -hmm. of of the session of how to go about uh, sketching a bird in few simple steps. And once you, once you learn to draw this way, in fact, there's also a very Uh, doing this, the more you practice, it becomes so very easy. Then you can just, you know, go around sketching all the trees and birds and other uh, insects, whatever you see around you. Okay. You've just opened a flood of squiggles and things on our papers <laughs> right now. Um, Abhisheka, we've got a very interesting question. Uh, Kerala Vision Empower wants to know this. How can art-based activities, how can they be made accessible for a child with visual impairment? Can you please uh, tell us a little about 
how we go about doing this yeah uh, so yeah this is another uh, aspect that we have been thinking a lot about uh, and in fact some of the uh, nature educators have been working on uh, so one is uh, through hearing um, and touch so uh, i i think especially bird songs play a big role uh, working with uh, uh, children like this um so uh, so i would again uh, encourage you to take a look at the handbook there is a small section on uh, working with um, uh, how to go about uh, working with uh, visually impaired uh, children uh, hopefully that will help but bird songs and uh, taking them out getting them to touch trees feel things uh, all that uh, helps a lot okay all right um <clears throat> i'm uh, curious um, you've talked about children being uh, you know scared about art but are there children who still prefer to explain things in words rather than drawings um yeah i have uh, come across uh, uh, um, i mean children who have uh, who have issues with words as well as who have issues with drawing uh, i think uh, children are much more comfortable uh, saying things than actually writing they would rather uh, 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 you know not write at all <laughs> so that way uh, see art doesn't always have to be about drawing so like i said with this tamil nadu school experience that i had you can uh, you can look at what is it that they are comfortable with comfortable with there the kids were so very comfortable with acting so you know we just got i mean honestly i am i don't have experience in theater but then i just uh, it was like i said it's all about facilitating it's all about learning together it's not about what i know and what i want to teach so we kid i got together with the kids and we said okay we'll just come up with a skit you know we wrote uh, we wrote songs like in 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 you know small songs we compose music use, using some uh, film music that the kids knew and we used it all in the in the play so it's just about using any art form that is comfortable okay that's nice um okay so uh, children give you feedback uh, others give you feedback you get feedback from them uh, so on the nature of feedback itself you've written in your article i'll read it what matters is the experience that you, that the child goes through while engaging with art and not how the artwork looks after completion so this is what you told us a little about could you elaborate on this yes so um uh, so for for example as i already told you when you go out and look at a tree or an insect um it's about sitting and um drawing that in order to get connected to that particular object that's in front of you it's not about at the end of it all like what is it that you have it's not about what you want to display it's about the time that you spend with that particular tree or bird or animal uh, mm. this is what i was trying to say okay good uh now now we come to a very important question an important challenge that many teachers face is the constraint of time taking children out even to the school playground takes time to come up with lesson plans get materials for activities to facilitate the reflective discussion all this seems uh, pretty daunting do you have any suggestions on how they can manage all this yeah so so um uh, in fact we do understand the challenges that teachers face which is also why especially as part of the early bird program we are really coming up with a lot of games and activities that uh, teachers can use it like you know it's readily available all you have to do is based on the age group of the children and how much time you have on hand you just can download these uh, materials and uh, print them out or use these games and just uh, even if you you know there are sometimes there are games which can be played for like in 10 15 minutes so there's a there's a game that we have called which explains the life cycle of a bird and you hardly need 15 minutes to play that game and it can be played indoors so we have uh, there are a lot of resources out there it's just about you know uh, making combinations and using them in the classroom and also using art um, or nature as examples when you teach other subjects you know when you're teaching counting or when you're teaching about colors uh, you could take examples 
from nature itself when you're talking about colors um you could ask the kids to collect you know when they're coming to school co collect some fallen leaves or fallen flowers and talk about colors and uh, or or even when it comes to counting the other thing is you could also it's it's also about you know um sometimes you may not have time or space to take children to do an activity but when you when you give them certain stories or uh, certain ex uh, exciting information kids on their own can observe things on their way to school or back home so it's just yeah. about putting these ideas into their head to just just start looking around the exciting things that are around us mm -hmm. okay that game sounds quite interesting could you tell us a little quickly about it what game is that so it's it's a it's a set of cards that you can print and um, it has different uh, uh, it uh, so, so rounds like there is one round on bird migration there's one round on how a bird um, uh, kind of finds a territory and defends a territory then one round on you know finding a part a partner then building a nest and then it's actually a team game where uh, four teams are formed and they have to pick out one of these cards uh and read out what is in there in fact each of the teams will have a representative who's actually the bird they all stand in a line and the team reads out what is in the card based on the card uh, what is the information in the card the representative will have to do an action and sometimes uh, for example i can say that you know um when we talk about migration there might be a card which says uh, uh, the migratory birds have landed to so and so village at the villages have protected their area which means that team gets a point so they get to go forward or i can say that this migratory bird came to this place and uh, the the lake is polluted then the team loses the point so so it's kind of uh, kind of getting children to understand how hard a bird life life is uh but through through fun games okay that's nice uh, i hope a lot of teachers can play this game with their uh, students uh, abhisheka uh, we are going to wrap up now uh, so are there any parting thoughts anything you'd like to tell our viewers teachers educators yeah i yeah i i would just like to say that um Uh, you know wildlife is all around us in fact um if you um we do share space with wildlife even inside our homes we have the house geckos we have the spiders and ants um it's about how uh, you know the more we observe them we will understand how fascinating their lives are um so we don't really need to feel that you need to go to a forest or you need to travel far off or you need a lot of money to see wildlife no uh, wildlife is just uh, all around us so it's just about opening our eyes and ears and mm -hmm. uh, watching what's happening around us okay all uh, right so abhisheka and all of you who've joined us today a big thank you a big thank you also from all the little uh critters around me somewhere uh if uh, for the viewers if you have any uh, pressing question for the author please do send them to us at i wonder at apu.edu.in uh we will do our best to get them answered and abhisheka please be ready to answer all those questions uh thank you very much for uh, giving us all these wonderful uh, you know insights into your work and the work that teachers can do using art and ecology uh viewers please do join us for our next webinar on june 14 2023 uh thank you once again um i would like to thank all the viewers who have joined in on a, a weekday uh for spending your time uh, attending this webinar i also wanted to uh, add that as bird uh, as part of the early bird program we will be having a webinar where um, we are uh, inviting teachers who been doing uh, nature education and uh, trying to understand how despite uh, the lack of time and the syllabus they have to cover how do they manage to integrate uh, nature education uh, in their classrooms uh so we will send out uh, information about that so you can also follow uh, early bird social media 
uh, pages uh, to keep yourself updated and um, thanks so much to the entire team of uh, i wonder mala chitra and shenaz for this uh, wonderful evening thank you thank you thanks a lot and viewers if you've not already subscribed uh, please do subscribe to i wonder uh, and i'm sure you'll be rewarded with plenty of uh, information from people like abhishek thank you thanks so much